Is it ready? Good evening everybody. I'm Aaron Solomons from Free Divers. Uh, welcome to our webinar this evening. Uh, we have a question that I want to answer straight away uh, that may take a certain amount of time. Uh, it's concerning pregnancy and free diving. Uh, I have personal experience of this. Uh, about uh, 15 and three quarter years ago, uh, we had first hand experience for this. I'm going to answer this as a narrative. I'm going to tell a story here. And uh, we'll see whether the story succeeds in answering the questions. Uh, this was in about uh, 2000, uh, sorry, in 1997. Uh, Pippin came to Elat and was going to do a course on the sled for seven of my best students. Uh, what he asked was that they be able to do at least uh, 43 meters without a mask, in constant weights, with bifins, uh, as a sort of entry guarantee of a certain standard for entry into the course. And they all achieved it, uh, with one exception. He brought a young guy up from Egypt and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't with us during the training cycle. Anyway, uh, amongst the uh, seven best students was my wife, uh, Maria Teresa Solomons, um, who uh, had been training very hard even before that course because she was very high up. This is 1997. Uh, she'd already achieved 52 meters in bifins, plastic bifins in those days, and that wasn't too bad a deal. And she was going forward. Now, the only trouble with this was that uh, when she was training hard, which involved not only in-water training, but a lot of out-of-water uh, out training as well. Uh, when her body weight went down to 47 kilos, uh, she lost her period. So we had no idea what was in store for us. Anyway, um, Pippin came. Uh, we did the course. Maria Teresa had been diving deep. And uh, after Pippin went, a short time after he went, um, we were going underwater fishing. So we went out on our bicycles to get to the marina. And um, about halfway, she stopped by the side of the road and was violently sick. And. Um, so I said, well, you know, what was all that about? And she said, well, I think I probably ate something that disagreed with me. Um, the following morning, the same thing happened. So um, we thought, you know, it might be a good idea to um, check things out. Uh, we did, and uh, I can't remember how many bars come up, but the wrong number of bars, or <laughs> the right number of bars came up and she was pregnant. Uh, so anyway, uh, this, this provoked a little bit of a dilemma for us. The first question was, was the child going to be, I mean, was, was the embryo hypoxic? And would it suffer brain damage? Uh, there were all kinds of fears involved. Uh, and we consulted our local doctor who said at that point he had no idea. Uh, anything in the literature that he could get hold of um, was um, uh, really non-existent. It was all about women in scuba. And that's dealing with the absorption of gases, and it's uh, a completely different physiology. 
So eventually I got hold of a person who I've been a lifetime friend of. He was head of the um, um, uh, Department of Physiology in the American Navy in Bethesda, in Maryland. A guy called Art Backrack, who died unfortunately recently. He was a very close friend and something of an angel and something of a walking encyclopedia. And I phoned him. He was then living in New Mexico and I was in Israel. And um, I said to him, Art, uh, do you think you can dig up anything in literature on women diving deep, free diving, uh, in early stages of pregnancy? And he said, look, Aaron, off the top of my head, I have no idea, but give me four days to work on it. Uh, it took a little bit more than four days, not much. But uh, he came up with an answer. But during the time that we were waiting, a local doctor also came up with a half answer. He said, look, if the embryo is hypoxic, it's going to show up in the development of the long bones. So I recommend ultrasound tests on literally a weekly or more frequent basis. Well, Maria Teresa at that time was not an Israeli citizen, did not have uh, social health, and we had no health insurance, and each ultrasound was at least a couple of hundred dollars. And uh, that was a lot of money for us in those days. Still is. Anyway, um, so we waited for Art's answer. And uh, Art came back to us and said, look, I found papers by a guy called Suki Han, who did experiments or observations of the Japanese Ama divers, who, according to the papers, were diving into their eighth month of pregnancy. Well, there we had as good an answer as we were likely to get between the two of them. And we decided to go on with the pregnancy. So the next thing was hop on to a plane to India where the ultrasound cost $2 instead of $200. And uh, that was a great saving. Anyway, we went off to uh, India where we lasted into her eight month pregnancy. And uh, the story has a very happy sequel. Um, it had its ups and downs because just before we left, Maria Teresa was doing yoga and she was demonstrating to a student a handstand. And for the student's benefit, she was doing it against a wall. Now, on the wall uh, was hanging uh, an Olympic bow that I had, which is a three-part thing. Anyway, the middle section is heavy and sharp. And she knocked it down with her foot. And it fell and smashed her little finger. Well, after a few days, and the thing was at a very funny angle and all the rest of it, uh, eventually the coin fell. And we decided, hey, we better do something about this. So we went along to the emergency in the local hospital. And uh, there we met our doctor, uh, wonderful family doctor who also happens to be a diving doctor, a doctor of hyperbaric medicine called Nahum Gao, who I will be ever grateful to his lovely bedside manner, etc. And um, anyway, he said, well, you better go and have it x-rayed. So we went and had it x-rayed. And uh, on the way out, uh, Maria Teresa noticed on the wall a notice in Hebrew. And she said, Aaron, um, what is that? What's it say? And, oops, what it said was that um, <laughs> you should inform the technician if you're pregnant because, you know, he's going to supply you with one of these lovely uh, lead aprons to protect you. Well, um, this is the first time I'd ever seen her burst into tears. Uh, and she was very upset and was really stressed and didn't know what was going to happen to the poor kid. 
And Nahum had been going all through uh, dilemmas about the kid being hypoxic and, and all the rest of it. So she told him the latest story that she'd just been x-rayed and hadn't told the technician and what could possibly happen. Now Nahum has a wonderful bedside manner so he said well the good possibility that the child is going to be compacted and radioactive. So um, full marks to Nahum. Anyway the kid is uh, a champion athlete in so many spheres it's, uh, it's disgusting. He's far better than either of us. Um, he's a superb free diver. Uh, he was in a selected team that were going to be groomed for uh, Olympic trials for Mexican kids for high dive. Um, he does boxing and kung fu and climbs and uh, kayaks and uh, does all the good things in life and is an excellent swimmer. So um, mind you having thought of that he does struggle with mathematics. Well, so did I anyway. That's probably in the genes. So here we are. Um, it pretty much all answered the question to me. And the answer, the reason why, I think is very obvious. I think that blood shift also favors the womb. And that uh, that's a reason that the child uh, got a continuous supply of oxygen and so that's another uh, benefit that accrues to the um, wonderful total of benefits that we get from the diving reflexes. Uh, I hesitate uh, with one single statistic to draw conclusions and recommend to pregnant women uh, free diving. Um, the first two months of pregnancy, I am told, is where uh, there is sort of borderline possibilities of hypoxia anyway. Um, but the only thing I can do, and this is maybe not so much, the purpose of, what I, of this story is not to guide people on what shall I do if I become pregnant, but if somebody has become pregnant and has made the same mistakes we are, uh, they at least have a story that could console them that the outcome uh, was uh, favorable. And no, no big tragedies with that. So there we have it. We really do not have enough statistics to date. Uh, the Japanese women were not diving. I mean, the absolute maximum that the Yama are diving anyway is about 25 meters. And we were diving an awful lot deeper than that. So um, I'm not quite sure how relevant their case would have been anyway. But there's the story. and. Uh, maybe it'll help somebody in some way. Now the purpose of tonight which is kind of experimental is I really wanted to talk about uh, a superb dry exercise that we do for stress breath hold. Um, I consider that if I had one single exercise that I had to choose for improving my breath hold for diving, and I'm leaving out static here, and if I'm going to a competition where static is one of the uh, competitive disciplines, okay, for static you have to train static. But if it's one of the um, diving disciplines or even one of the pool disciplines uh, this is a superb tool and I would say that it is superior to having just a good static. Now let me be clear on this. Obviously it's a good idea to have both but uh, if I had to choose one it would be the stress breath hold. Now the first thing to do, the first thing that I'm going to tell you is uh, 
how we plan this thing. Because the first thing that I ask myself is, what is my immediate objective? And here I'm going to start trying to mess with some uh, illustrations, and I only hope we can arrange them so you can see them. I have here a board. I'm not quite sure whether we can see this. Wait. Yeah. Okay, it's supposed to represent a boy on the surface going down a line for a 100 meter dive. Okay? Now, as we can see, or I hope we can see, uh, I've put neutral buoyancy, I'm just playing around with figures here, I put neutral buoyancy at 15 meters. And I put people going into the glide, yeah, at 30 meters. Now, a little bit of explanation for those who haven't been into this kind of diving. Um, until 15 meters, the first part of the dive, you're going to be a lot of positive buoyancy. You're going to have to be overcoming a lot of positive buoyancy. As we approach 15 meters, we can see the little plus marks get fewer. And at 15 meters, we see a plus and a minus mark. In other words, we're neutrally buoyant. After that, we start to get more and more negative. Okay, at 30 meters or thereabouts, yeah, just for the sake of argument here, we're going to be going into the glide, which is like a static fall. Yeah? And here we are until 100 meters. So I'm falling effectively 70 meters. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that this may not represent the tactics that you might be doing on a 100-meter dive. I've merely taken a two-part dive here because it's easier to illustrate. In other words, you're going down to 30 meters or at the point at which, if you stopped all movement, you wouldn't decelerate. You wouldn't start going slower. If you stopped all movement at 16 meters, you may fall, but terribly slowly. We want to fall at a good speed. So I've chosen here a two-part dive. I am well aware of the fact that an awful lot of dives today may be three-part dives, where um, you're going down to, uh, let's say, um, 15 meters, 20 meters, and then uh, you are doing a kick and glide, kick and a longer glide, and kick and a longer glide still, and you may be going into uh, your final free fall, your final glide at, I don't know, 55 meters or wherever. Um, I'm merely illustrating how we plan a training from this. So please take uh, the thing not as a literal pattern for a very deep dive, but how we would begin to work things out. Okay, so let's look at it this way. We have 30 seconds yeah, of effort here, and we have 70 seconds of static. Now, on the way up, things are reversed. I have 90 seconds of effort and 10 seconds of static. Static being a, uh, the phase where I'm not moving, either my arms, or my arms or my legs. So let's just do a little total. Uh, I have altogether 30 seconds of effort on the way down and 90 seconds on the way up. That means 120, that's two minutes. I have 70 seconds you know, of static on the way down and 10 seconds of static on the way up because I'm floating up from 10 meters. Okay, that's 80 seconds. So I have 80 seconds, which is a, which is a minute 20 of static and I have two minutes of effort. Right. Now let's discuss what I do. 
I sit on a little stool or on the ground and I breathe out and it, this is for the dive that we've just planned, the 100 meter dive. And I'm only taking 100 meters, not because uh, I'm expecting you all to be doing 100 meters, but I'm just taking it because if the figures are not nice round figures, my mathematics are not up to it. So it's only an illustration. So I'm sitting on my stool, and I'm going to be breathing, yeah, for a certain length of time, certainly not more than two minutes. I may be practicing breathing up minimally with, let's say, six to nine breaths. A single big breath, and without packing, I hold for a minute twenty static while still sitting on the stool. At a minute twenty, I get up and I walk. And I try and walk, still holding my breath, for two minutes. If I can do that, I've achieved the objective that I want to get to by training the breath walk. And I may be a long way away from that one today. But I'm training towards it. So, if your example, if your objective today was 50 meters, well, where are you going to go into the glide? Depends on your, how you're waiting. Let's say you're going into the glide at 25 meters, just to keep life simple. You would have 25 meters of effort, 25 seconds in other words, on the way down you would have 25 seconds of static. On the way up you would have 10 seconds of static and you would have 45 seconds, sorry, uh, you would have 40 seconds of uh, effort. So here we go. For that one, 40 and 25 uh, is a minute five of effort. And you would have static um, 35 seconds. So in other words, you'd start your, your training by saying, okay, what I want to do is I want to hold my breath for 35 seconds and see if I can walk for a minute five and see how that works out. So uh, this is how we plan our ultimate objectives and we have interim stages. Now, how many repetitions? Here's the, a very funny thing. When I'm beginning and I'm, when the numbers are not big, uh, not more than three repetitions. Because each time you walk, I want the static phase to be the same. Yeah, in the, each of the three repetitions. For the 50 meters, it might be 35 seconds. So each time you walk, 35 seconds static, and each time you walk, you try and go further than the last time. While still, of course, holding your breath. Now, the best thing is a single long shot, not walking in a circle, not walking around a room, yeah, but a single long shot. Where you sit, you breathe up, hold your breath for the static phase, then while still holding your breath, get up and walk in a straight line as far as you can, yeah, without either losing your direction, because that means you're exaggerating, yeah, or getting tunnel vision. And when you can't hold your breath any longer, you stop and make a mark. Then you walk back to where you began, and you begin the process exactly the same thing again, only this time you're going to pass the last mark, and each time you try and go further. I recommend that you do only three, rep the only three repetitions, and that they're absolutely without taking any prisoners, to the best that you can do. 
as you start getting better and better at this thing, we will reduce the number of repetitions. When you're really fairly high up in the thing, where you're holding your breath for a minute 20 and you're walking close to two minutes, uh, only one repetition. How many times a week should you be doing this? Not more than twice. And they should be well spaced, not two consecutive days. Now we're going to talk about the interesting part of this thing, because the first times you do it, I recommend that you do it with a heart monitor. And we're going to talk about how to read your pulse, and what kind of information you can get from reading your pulse. Now you're becoming your own trainer. So, if I can get this board working again... Okay. Now, I hope you've got a pen and paper, and I hope we can see the board. Right. Uh, <coughs> let's see if I can do that. Some of it uh, was washed by Alice's tail. Okay, some of it was washed out by Alice's tail, but here we go. You actually check your breath four times. Um, what side am I on here? It, it completely reverses it. Uh -huh. What? Uh -huh. That's the... I want to be on the other side first. Okay, very good. Um, this is showing the four, the, the four stages of the breath hold. This, I'll be checking my pulse after the ventilation. Here I'm checking my pulse, the second one down, at the end of the static hold. The third one yeah, is checking my pulse at the end of the walk before I take my first breath. And this is the recovery. That means I'm still standing on the same place where I stopped walking and I watch the heart monitor go up to the highest point and remember the number. Now these are figures for somebody who is really, really in the upper echelons here. Yeah, he's a very well trained diver. If we notice, uh, he has, let's say, 80 beats a minute at the end yeah, of his ventilation. Now during the static phase, it goes down to 50 beats a minute. Okay, we can, we can understand that. But hey, here's the really funny thing. During the walk, at the end of the walk, it's 28. If you were to sit in a chair and breathe normally, your pulse at a resting rate might be 60 beats a minute. But the moment you got up and started walking, it would go up, wouldn't it? Well, here we are in a trained freediver. It isn't going up, it's going down. Okay, that tells me exactly how good his, breathing, his breath hold reflex is. And we'll learn to uh, milk a lot more information out of this. I'm sorry about the small screen, and it's um, very difficult to manage here. Um, we're going to try doing this in a, a um, YouTube video before long, where we'll manage this a little bit better. Uh, Right at the bottom here, I have the 110 and 120. That's the recovery rate. And that figure actually tells me how hard he's pushed it. Let's do a comparison. This is the diver who is, uh, I would say, um, the well-trained, reasonably well-trained, uh, average free diver. He's also got a heartbeat of 80, sorry, Alice wiped that with her tail, uh, 88 or 88 at the end of ventilation. I've taken those figures as the same for all of them because it, they're really not important. Um, thank you. At the end of the static, it's gone down by about 10 beats. And during the walk, it's also gone down, not by huge amount, but by 10 beats. Uh, you'll notice that 90 or up to 110, that he's pushed it, but he's not 
capable of pushing it as much as the guy on the left, the guy who is the elite athlete. Now, here we get uh, the beginner. Um, 88 beats a minute, or 80 beats a minute at the end of ventilation. Uh, at the end of his static, it's only gone down by five, but it has gone down. During the breath walk, it's either stayed the same or even gone up. And the final figure, 80 or 90, shows me that he hasn't pushed it terribly hard. Because it should jump up radically the moment he starts breathing. Uh, now here's the funny thing. Let's go back to the uh, elite diver. Right, here I've got him here. See, damn, it's absolutely reversed this thing. Okay. Would it help you if I hold it? Yeah, I think it would. Okay, then I'm wrong. Um, if you can hold that. No, uh, no, I need to see the figures. Okay. Okay. Now with the elite diver, see what I mean by reverse? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. uh, here's the problem. Um, during the static, yeah, it goes down to 50. Fine. During the walk, it's going down to as much as 28. Now, that doesn't happen at once. The first thing that happens is that the pulse rate goes up, tachycardia. And then, after a certain phase, it starts to go down. And that phase may be quite late. It may be right at the end of his breath hold, where suddenly the brain clicks in and says, hey, we've got an emergency here. It's talking to the heart and saying, look, we have to do something about this because I'm supposed to be conserving the amount of oxygen that, uh, that I possibly, all the oxygen I possibly can. So the brain then commands the heart to slow down the pulse rate. And so it's a protection mechanism. And that may kick in at first quite late. So in other words, if you're watching your heart rate monitor the whole time, don't be alarmed that after your um, your static phase and you start walking that it goes up. It'll probably drop just before you're ready to give up. Now, uh, the other things that this can uh, train. I'm going to try and do this in a different color here. Can I have a black one? Yeah. Uh, we mentioned a little bit about this before. Um, when a person starts to hold their breath, uh, the, first, the first thing that happens is that the pulse rate goes up. Tachycardia, it's called. Now, it'll go up to a certain point and then start falling. Bradycardia. Now, the question is, we're looking at this triangle here at the top. Um, the question is, where does this happen? It could be a short tachycardia phase and a long bradycardia phase. I'll draw it. Like that. Whoop. Horrible system, this because it's all reversed. Okay, short tachycardia phase, long bradycardia phase. Now, don't forget if there's a time limit on the static, let's say a minute, you may get an equilateral triangle. But if you're holding your breath for a minute and a half, uh, it's not going to be an equilateral triangle anymore because the bradycardia is going to be going down and down and down. Now, on the other hand, it can look completely the reverse, where you get a very long tachycardia phase, 
and a short uh, bradycardia phase. Um, in other words, it takes a long time for the bradycardia uh, to click in. Okay? It takes a long time for that to click in. Uh, that's worth knowing for a trainer. It can indicate the number of warm-ups a person has or needs. Uh, it can indicate something about ventilation. Uh, it's um, in itself there is neither good nor bad here. There is what there is. Uh, does it change with training? Probably the tachycardia to bradycardia thing probably doesn't respond that much to training nor should it, because we don't have an ideal tachycardia to bradycardia proportion that we're aiming towards. So I don't see any great point in worrying about that, but I do see a point in knowing what the situation is. Because otherwise numbers could be quite puzzling. You could find, yeah, that if you have a, for instance, a 30 second breath hold, in static that your pulse rate is actually higher at the end of it than uh, at the end of the ventilation phase. I'm talking about, um, wait, how do I get this number uh, over here? Yeah? You may find that at the end of the static, it's, it's going to be higher than at the end of the ventilation. You say, oh my god, I haven't got a reflex. No, you have got a reflex. You probably just got a long tachycardia phase. So in other words, it's actually consoling to know what our particular pattern is there. Um, when it comes to the static to walk cycle, now, which is further down here, um, there it's a different thing. Because as I said, the tachycardia phase, uh, sorry, the bradycardia phase may come in very late into that. And very often does with most people. So there's an awful lot of information that you can get. Now, the most valuable thing is knowing how to keep a log. A log is that you do the four phases. You write down the four phases of your pulse rate during each of the four phases of the breath walk. At the end of the ventilation, at the end of the static phase, at the end of the walk, before you take the first breath and then while still standing on the spot your recovery what it goes up to you watch the, the heart rate monitor all the time up 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 uh, right going up to there because it started to fall I remember that number and I write that down uh, just a, a very brief word in the middle of this about heart rate monitors. Do not take one for this exercise uh, where it's measuring the oxygen either on your wrist or on your fingertip. They're absolutely useless for this because a trained freediver will get blood shift even on land. Yeah, it happens. Your pulse rate on the... Uh, on the um, if it's taken at the wrist, etc., is not going to be necessarily going to be wildly accurate. Um, the best thing is a chest strap. Uh, if you are into gadgets today, the chest straps are connected to yeah. smartphones. Okay, that's which will build you a beautiful graph. And, uh, okay, that's a word of advice from my technical expert, Alina. Mm -hmm. 
that says that uh, you can just use the chest strap in conjunction. There are programs you can use it in conjunction with your smartphone, and they'll even provide you with lovely uh, ways of logging it. Okay, the other things that you want to uh, log. You start your stopwatch the moment you start breathing. And each time you're breathing for the same time, let's say two minutes. Right. Uh, your um, static, you know what it's going to be because you decide beforehand what it's going to be. And then the next thing is your walk. Well, apart from knowing what the heartbeat is, we want to know how long it is. Yeah? So don't forget to stop your stopwatch the moment you stop walking. Now, the other thing that we want to know is, because we want to try and eliminate variables here. Uh, absolutes are not of interest to me in this. Now, I'll, I'll go back and explain what I mean here. Um, we're trying to eliminate variables, so we uh, measure in double paces how far we've walked. Double paces means that you walk back at a normal pace, not changing your pace at all, in the same pace you walked out with, which should have been a normal walking pace, and you count every time your left foot hits the ground. That's double paces. Yeah? So you do left, that's one, right, left, that's two. Okay? Sorry. Sorry, I did. Uh, I misled you there. You begin, let's say, with your with your right foot, yeah. So you take a right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, and you in count each time your left foot hits the ground. In simple words, one, two, three. Excellent. Okay, we got that. <laughs> Nice demonstration. I didn't think of that one. Thank you. Um, now, it's better than taking a tape measure and measuring it or doing it on a football field where you've got exact measurements. We're not interested in exact measurements. Your paces from time to time are not going to vary. And we're interested in merely seeing how your performance progresses. Now, look, let me go back to the heart rate figures. If you find that your heartbeats are substantially different from what we're seeing here, it doesn't mean that you're not a good freediver or don't have the potential for it. We're not interested. <coughs> Some people may, at the end of the ventilation phase, have a heartbeat of 120. So what? Some people have a naturally higher heart rate. I'm more interested <coughs> not in the absolute numbers, but how they perform. Whether during the static phase it falls. Whether during the walking phase it falls. Uh, <coughs> perfect example is Alina's. She's a very this. good free diver. I don't know whether we can see this, but her heart rate numbers are high. <coughs> but the fall between them is excellent. These are three walks that I've done back four years ago and just began free diving. Uh, those who know me knows that I'm not uh, the fittest person on earth. I don't think you can be heard. I'm, uh, I'm, <coughs> I'm small, uh, my heart is small and hence beats very fast. So I began the exercise at 103 in static and went to 73. Uh, at the end of the walk, of the first walk, it went to 77, and then jumped back to 117. The second walk, that I'm gives you a hard. perfect example, uh, the, that gives you a perfect example to how actually to write it down. The second walk, uh, I began the walk at 104 uh, in the ventilation, 81 after the static, 61 in the end of the walk, and 126, who just shows you how much actually I pushed it. The last one, I began at 109, 
In the end of a static, it went immediately to 68. In the end of the walk, in 61. And I guess I didn't push that much. But uh, that was 130 in the end of the exercise. Okay, so that gives you some idea that actually the... Um it doesn't matter what your numbers are, it matters really what's happening with the numbers, how they behave, how they change, and whether they go down. Um, Ask Cliff Edson what is he LOLing about? <laughs> so, uh, please, um, if you have any questions on this one, uh, let me know next week because I consider it to be. Uh, one of the single most important uh, exercises we can do. One of the reasons is you don't need a partner. Yeah? You can do this anywhere by yourself that you've got somewhere to walk. Now, other remarks concerning this. Uh, turning it into um, a more of a stress exercise, like putting a uh, 20 kilo backpack on to do the exercise, really has no merit. Sorry, been there, done that. Uh, it has no merit to do it up a hill slope. Uh, it has no merit um, to try and replicate more closely the actual pattern that happens during a dive. I'm well aware of the fact that during a dive, uh, if we were trying to replicate it, it would look something like this. That uh, we walk, instead of sitting there doing static at first. First of all, we ventilate, we hold our breath and walk, then we do static, then we walk again, yeah? and then just before the end we do another small static. Uh, we've tried all this. Uh, it may replicate it more, but it, is, it gives you no advantage whatsoever in training that way. One of the factors that you have to build in is that uh, you're dealing with water and you're not dealing with gravity. Uh, you're dealing with all kinds of physiological and physical factors that are not parallel. We are trying to train our breath hold, our heart, our cardiac performance, everything else, um, to the best of our ability, with a dry exercise. And I would challenge anybody to find better dry exercises than these ones. It has a lot of small variations and possibilities of it. As I say, uh, when I've got somebody of a high level, uh, I just had David Kent, who just broke a uh, British record in no fins uh, of 70 meters, which was very respectable, and he will go on to much higher things. He's a superb diver. Um, his training schedule was one single repetition of the breath walk, and that is done really without taking prisoners. And it's done twice a week. So, if there are any questions on that one, uh, please bring them up next week. I'd be happy to clarify anything. Let me just check to see if I've got any other questions coming up. And... You don't see any, huh? Okay. Milena wanted to ask something, but she did do it. And Cliff wanted to ask something, but I don't see his question. Okay, I'm going to give you two or three seconds, Cliff or Milena. If you had a question, uh, please go for it uh, now, and uh, if it's not appearing within the next few seconds, then uh, we'll call it quits for the night. Well, you can tell about the um, nice experience with it this night. Ah, right. Um, yeah, I'm kind of cutting it short tonight, because last night we had... Uh, a rocket fiesta in a lot. <coughs> Our neighbors decided to send us some fireworks. Um, uh, the Iron Dome uh, apparently caught it in midair. But uh, I was fast asleep. 
didn't know anything about it, didn't hear the air raid siren go off. And first thing I knew was that I did hear, I vaguely heard three or four bangs. And then I did hear a very faint siren. I thought it was some ambulance or something. Uh, but it was actually the air raid siren. And the next thing I had was um, the neighbors banging on the window. Uh, we live in what is virtually supposed to be the air raid shelter in the house. And they wanted in. There was the dear lady from next door was hyperventilating and, oh dear, oh dear, I'm frightened, I want to get in. Yeah, so we had this, and then I, I thought, my God, the air raid shelter is actually my bedroom. I'm not sure that I want them in bed for the rest of the night. Um, very uncharitable, but I mean, a lot is a lot, and you know, it happens infrequently, and then it's usually one bang and good night. And that, of course, is exactly what happened. But it was uh, disturbing to the sleep. So anyway, the cat was also disturbed and upset. We had to quieten the cat down. So uh, it was quite a night. Now, just a final check to see if we've got anything um, brewing. Uh, Cliff Etzel wrote a very intelligent one, what? And LOL. And LOL. And Melena's from the situation I think okay so that's all for us the next webinar will be hopefully back to a Wednesday Tuesday is better Tuesday sorry Tuesday two weeks from today which would make it the 27th and we'll have it at 9.30 at night and uh, very much look forward to seeing you all then. And please, if you have questions, I'm running out of topics, and very soon I will therefore be running out of webinars, because I'm not just going to spout uh, whole uh, courses of, uh, or training schedules of free diving. So please, if you've got individual questions, uh, bring them up. If not, we will be phasing out the webinars. Um, Cliff wrote that he will ask you privately as his question is longer than can be asked during the webinar. Right. Uh, I hope he will... Um, perhaps, what did Rick Roskin write? Rick Roskin wrote perhaps you could list a list of discussed topics. Right. I will try and do that, Rick. Um, Rick, uh, would you, uh, my Dutch is not very good. Would you accept that in English? Okay. He uh, says perhaps you could list, make a list of discussed topics so you can think of new topics which are not discussed in public. Yeah, well, uh, I'm looking for suggestions in that and I would very much welcome yours. You're a person who would be, uh, I'm sure, could produce some very good topics for me. Okay, great, and very much look forward to your cooperation. Look forward to meeting you on the 27th, and uh, I do hope that there are questions, yeah, or suggested topics of for Yappy. Okay, okay. wait a second. Um, Cliff asked, uh, I just did my first full cycle of CO2 tolerance, empty lung, and the pneumonia walk. Struggled the most with the empty lungs and could, couldn't get past 40 seconds at the empty lung up now. Is this normal for the first time attempting? What did he do? He did, uh, was this breath walk or was it... Uh, what? No, I'm on Rick at the moment. Uh, Kick on Cliff, okay, let me see. He said that he just did his first full cycle of CO2 tolerance, empty lung, and a now walk. Okay. Struggled the most with the empty lung and couldn't get past 40 seconds empty lung of now in this norm. Is this normal for the first time empty? Uh, I would say yes. Yes, Cliff. It also very much depends. Look, when you're doing uh, empty lung statics, 
Please don't use the term empty lung apnea, it's confusing. It could be empty lung breath walk or it could be empty lung static. I presume you're talking about static. Yeah, you wrote. Okay, uh, good. Now we're on the same page. If it's empty lung static, I would have suggested that you begin so with something very modest like a 15 second breath hold or a 10 second breath hold and then work up in increments of 5 or 10 seconds, not more. And getting up to 45, I would say, was very respectable on the first. Uh, fun enough, uh, it increases far, far um, more quickly than your full lung statics will increase. So there's really uh, a lot of hope in that direction. Um, I believe in uh, mixing and matching. I do believe that uh, if you do only empty lung uh, statics or empty lung uh, breath walk, uh, it's not a good idea unless you're going to dive that way. But uh, a certain proportion of your training should be empty lung and it will help the, uh, the full lung training very much. I'm not a believer in FRC. I've only found one use in my life for FRC and uh, I'm not prepared to go into that right at the moment. Um, but uh, when I'm talking about empty, I'm talking about two residual capacity without reverse packing. But everything you can squeeze out and work on that because that is what is going to change the system. Okay, have we got other questions there? Or other uh, yes, um, wait a second. One second, the one question is okay. That was pure uh, Cliff said, okay, that helps greatly. Is there any form of ventilation in between each hole? Um, basically, uh, there it's not interval training, Cliff. Uh, that is a very good point and it's one that I should have uh, I should have put in when you're doing your breath walks uh, It's not interval don't start timing uh, between one two and three Yeah uh, When you feel ready and when you feel it's comfortable begin the next repetition uh, This is not interval training if we do interval training it's a completely different ballgame and it's going to look differently and it's going to feel entirely different and it's going to have different objectives. Um, this is very much stress O2 training. Anything more? I'm giving a moment for Vasile Lang who wanted to ask a question and could he do it in uh, in Tweetcam. Guys, all you have to do in order to write questions in the Tweetcam is just to register in Twitter. If you cannot do that or don't want to do it for a reason, please leave questions in any other form, either Deeper Blue, Facebook, SMS, email, or any other way that will reach us. Yeah. You don't, I mean, if you want to ask a question, you don't want to register on Twitter. Uh, send it to my email, yeah, uh, which is aron at freedivers.net or send it to our website which is www.freedivers.net yeah, or send it to my Facebook which is Aaron Solomon and uh, we'll be happy to uh, cope with any of that. Cliff completes the question with, for the static empty lung, non-walk, is there any ventilation at all as well? Uh, yes. Uh, Cliff, I recommend um, not huge breaths. I recommend that you uh, are literally sitting there and you're working at just slightly, very slightly over tidal volume. The kind of breathing that you might have just before you went to sleep, when you begin to get that sleepy feeling. If you can imagine that, that's what you're aiming for, yeah? 
then and hold your breath yeah but really getting it all out and then holding your breath um, empty lung static is a very good thing we also do apnea walk on empty lung um, there are people who should be careful about ventilating before the walk there are dangers there I've had people ventilate and then uh, uh, if they weren't doing a static phase uh, get up and pass out right the cliff says tidal volume breathing understood any number of ventilations in between each of those breath holds? Um, it's more important just to have a rest period and I would try doing not more than about six ventilations, six cycles. That should be at the most about a minute. Uh, I will talk about our ideas on ventilation. Um, I am not a believer in um, doing this thing that uh, apparently Ada recommends of that the exhalation be twice as long as the inhalation. I think that that's uh, um, tampering with nature too much. The best results come when you know what your own pattern is and understand why it is and don't try particularly to change it unless you absolutely are convinced that it's completely wrong but for you but basically I mean a lot of people have an even inhalation exhalation cycle uh, some people begin a series of ventilations with a uh, more or less even inhalation exhalation and naturally it finds as it gets longer uh, it will find um, that the exhalation becomes uh, longer but I'm not into uh, tampering with that proportion too much I hope that answers it Okay. Uh, you wrote excellent. Thank you. I was only doing one breath. LOL. No wonder I only go to 40 seconds. Um, I don't think that'll make a huge difference, Cliff. Uh, try it and let me know how it goes. Okay? Because I'd be very interested in, in having feedback on that. Um, Thank you all for your contributions tonight. Thank you for joining us. And as I say, safe diving until we meet again on the 27th. So from us here at Free Divers, from Alina, uh, Alice and myself. Wait, uh, wait a second. Vasil uh, succeeded in asking a question. Okay. I'm sorry to hold you in the Oh, I'm going to have to be paid overtime for this one. Go ahead. I wonder in terms of nutrition, would it be relevant to have a webinar a whoops, have a webinar where we can alter the pH acidity before the dive? Many thanks. Um I think we have been in the past. Maybe one just about that. I think we, we talked about this first. I mean the only thing that you can do that will dramatically change it is swallow an awful lot of bicarbonate of soda. Um, the result with that usually is uh, strong diarrhea. Uh, basically, it's against our philosophy to start messing too much with the system. Uh, 
observing your system and trying to find out uh, where your system feels comfortable is a very good idea. Uh, trying to force it into a particular direction like uh, messing with its pH levels and all the rest of it uh, usually it ends in disaster. Uh, I haven't, I mean, I've known an awful lot of people who've tried it. Uh, there are some diets that, if they suit you, like the alkaline diet, uh, the zone diet, and a few others, if they suit you, uh, they're probably, those two that I mentioned, are probably okay. There are some other diets that are very extreme that I definitely would not recommend. Uh, but if, you, if we're talking about the alkaline diet or something like this, it's not something that you do immediately before a free dive. I mean, the only thing I'm aware of where you can really substantially uh, alter the pH is, as I say, bicarbonate of soda, and I certainly wouldn't go in that direction. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that there's any particular merit in that one. Uh, of course, uh, there is a thing about lime juice, uh, which does um, uh, help, uh, and that's quite mild and quite benevolent. Right, sorry, you'll have to read that one for me. Um, Rick wrote, not only that, by Carmen, if I recall correctly, an English study did not show any benefit for free diving. Well, I don't know which study we're talking about. If we're talking about Kirk Crack's study of the thing, um, it's not so much that it didn't have a benefit for it. Um, it had no proven benefits and some very, very proven uh, disadvantages. Yeah, so uh, my answer is I'm not aware of any, uh, any diet would do that. Okay? Okay, okay guys. So, uh, as I say, safe diving, and I'll see you again hopefully on the 27th. So good night from all us and free divers. Thank you for joining us. Bye.